Good evening to you all. Uh, it's, it's extraordinary to think that there are more than 600 viewers with us tonight. Obviously, this is a topic that um, is uh, having a, generating a lot of interest, and we hope we will be able to address as many of your questions as possible. Don't be shy, ask. And uh, we'll really try to be as exhaustive as, as, as we can. Um, the uh, panel tonight uh, includes uh, very uh, good and, and great colleagues. I am Donata Vercelli, uh, a professor of cellular and molecular medicine at the University of Arizona and the director of the Arizona Center for the Biology of Complex Diseases. And I will moderate uh, tonight's discussion. Uh, and then uh, with us are uh, David Beda, the chair and professor in the Department of Bioethics and Medical uh, Humanism at the University of Arizona College of Medicine in Phoenix. We have Dee Quinn, who is a clinical lecturer at the University of Arizona College of Medicine and Pharmacy, um, and the director of the University of Arizona Genetic Counseling uh, Graduate Program. And Casey Romanowski, Assistant Professor of Cellular and Molecular Medicine at the University of Arizona, uh, as well as a, uh, a, a the holder of PhD in Human Genetics from uh, UCLA. Um, I, I want to thank uh, my uh, co-panelists, and I want to thank the uh, Arizona Public Media uh, for bringing together this forum tonight, which we hope will be uh, exciting. Uh, as a way of starting and getting the ball rolling, let me say that few disciplines today take us as close to the core of who we are as genetics does. And few disciplines have as broad a scope and as many implications and ramifications as genetic does, which is why we have this diverse panel tonight. And so to frame this conversation, um, I would like to start by asking and putting on the table a very broad question and theme, which is building on what uh, the audience just heard on your expertise and everything you know about the field in which you are. Where do you think genetics stands today? Um, where is it going to be 10 years from now? And most importantly, what are the achievements and the challenges that the field is going to have and face in terms of ethics, in terms of patients, in terms of care, and in terms of science? Um, I think that this would be a good way to get the ball rolling as the, then the questions go in. Who wants to go first? David, would you, would you start, perhaps? Well, I, I can do that. Um... Uh, as a as a as a physician and as an ethicist, the question always comes up: uh, Who's more important, and is it the who or is it the what? And so, when we look at genetics, uh, one can say that it is a what, but we're really looking at the who, the composition of the genetics, and that is the who. And so, the ethical challenge relating to genetics centers around uh, uh, how how important is it to us address the who and not always the what of the of the genetics of the chromosome of the DNA etc but who is it going to manifest who is it going to um, make better where are you going to mitigate the issues so the ethical issues from uh, from my perspective uh, comes down to uh, let's look at who we are from the genetic perspective uh, look at the ethical issues uh, looking forward, and making sure we address those uh, before we find ourselves in uh, in the quagmire or uh, in, in sinking mud, uh, not not being able to get out of them. And D, yeah. So I'm sure uh, you want to chime in. Well, I interestingly, you know, your question was where have we been and where are we going, and and I do think it's important to recognize our past. I'm a huge history fan. Um, and I think that we all learn from the past. And there's no question that genetics has made some pretty major mistakes um, over time. And, you know, I certainly, the, the episode talks about the eugenics movement and, and, and how that colored so much, I think, of even today's um, impressions about genetics. We've certainly moved a long way um, 
some of the um, examples that you've seen um, have given us more tools to think about um, what does what might these kinds of tests or um, uh, um, lead us to, and and therefore uh, um, perhaps address those very important ethical issues before we get us um, into the mud, um, and then it's it's much more difficult to answer. So I do think that the past um, uh, does provide us a tremendous opportunity to not make those mistakes again and to think carefully about where genetics is going um, and how we can be most helpful in that area. But at the same time, there is an enormous promise, right, Casey, for what's coming? Exactly. So, um, you know, I'll come at this from the perspective of the bench scientist who is just thrilled to have at their fingertips the sequence of the human genome. Mm -hmm. um, this happened, you know, during my training, and I was so privileged to come into research um, with the genome in hand, essentially. And um, so I'm not the best to speak about where we've come from, except for we've, I, you know, from the history, we've come so far, and the technology is so amazing these days that I think the challenge um, coming in geneticists, in genetics, for geneticists, is to really distill the information and this huge amount of data um, into meaningful bits. Mm -hmm. Because right now we are technologically advanced, but still kind of information um, mm -hmm. young, so mm -hmm. to speak. And so I think, um, you know, we kind of see what associations there are but we kind of don't know how to intervene or to act or to utilize a lot of the information. And so I think that that's the really exciting thing coming in genetics is to distill the complexity. Do, do we have a sense, this is a, a question that the audience is asking, do we have a sense for which new uh, approaches, technologies might become widespread uh, as it was put in, in, well, 20 to 50 years might be a little too long, but at least in, in the same year or not too distant future, what, what, where do we, where would we like to see this field expanding? Well, I think it's an important, if I may, sorry, it, it, I think it's an important, important question that needs to follow that, and I think it's an important one. But what I would ask, um, you know, if we look at the ethical issue, this we need to think about the technological imperative. Just because we can do something, should we? And there is technology out there and we're just moving along. It's just, it's like a rocket ship going straight up. And so, you know, no matter what, what type of technology we're talking about, it is going to advance and advance quickly because of this technolo technological imperative. We have it, let's use it, let's move forward. What we need to be extremely careful about, uh, which is what I, what I talked about earlier, and that is to just be conscious of the ethical issues of that surround that technological imperative. Uh, if we're cautious and if we ask the right questions and if we find the right answers, uh, technology will advance uh, the way it should uh, with, uh, with oversight. Uh, so, you know, the answer is, yeah, technological, technology is gonna expand. Um, we, just need to, we just need to keep a handle on it a little bit better. You know, I think Casey brought up a really important point and that is, um, the issue of education. And so um, it's, it's rather unfortunate, I think, that health literacy in general in the United States is pretty low. And now we're adding on to this body of health literature, this whole new science and how that impacts health literature and health understanding, literacy, excuse me, health understanding. Um, and so I do think we have a lot of work to do. And I think this kind of panel is a fabulous opportunity to begin that work of um, educating the public, our healthcare providers, um, our educators. Um, we have a lot to do. This is a very fast moving uh, space. And, and I do think um, our, uh, there is a big need for us to improve the education that's available to the public. If I may, uh bring up a, a, an issue that has been brought up by the uh, audience, but also I think is 
interesting in the clip that we just watched. As you, as you noticed, uh, Ken Burns had the foresight of giving a lot of space to CRISPR, uh, which at the time in which the um, documentary was filmed had not yet uh, been awarded the Nobel Prize that just received. So, which in a sense is a way to, of course, recognize the transformational mm -hmm. importance of that technology. So um, I think it might be um, good or useful for, for this um, commentary that we are trying to provide to go to perhaps use CRISPR as an example of a technology that has enormous power, enormous promise, also poses enormous questions and I'm sure difficulties uh, ethically. And so maybe if, if each of you could from her, his angle, uh, speak about that a little bit, I think it would be a good way to show where this field, what this field can really do and how, however, it should sort of restrain perhaps itself um, when, when it's appropriate. So can you, can you, Casey, can you briefly give a, um, uh, how can I say, uh, CRISPR 101 in, <laughs> in a few sentences? Well, do you mind asking that? Just to remind people <laughs> what they heard. I'm sure you can. I know you, you can, so. Yeah, so, so basically what CRISPR is, is it's something that um, very smart people recognized was happening in bacteria to protect themselves. Um, and that has been modified such that you can take the machinery, which is CRISPR, um, and put it, tell it to go anywhere into the human genome that you want it to with very, very um, tuned accuracy and either um, remove some of the DNA or put a little bit of white out on one of the letters of DNA and type in a new letter. Um, or, you know, there's even actual many more permutations of things that could be done than that. But it just gives us this huge flexibility as scientists to go in and test, you know, the function. What is the functional consequence of this little piece of DNA? Mm -hmm. What is the functional consequence in a cell or in a bacteria or in um, some yeast if we do this? Will it affect its metabolism? Will it affect how it um, grows? Will it, you know, Etc. And in the ease in which scientists are now able to answer these questions and the cost that's required is remarkable. Um, and so, so it's very exciting. Um, of course, when it comes to permanently changing the future of human genomes, it becomes very daunting. Um, but as we said, I think a lot of lessons have been learned. So hopefully those things won't um, happen. Um, and we're all going to do our best to prevent those from happening. So how do you see, Dee and, and, and David, how do you see this uh, developing and going forward? I, it, you know, again, I, I stress the fact that uh, this technology was awarded, was just awarded a few months ago, a Nobel Prize tells us that it is now in the Olympus of, of science, rightly so, mm -hmm. uh, because it was an extraordinary pursuit and an extraordinary intuition and an extraordinary piece of scientific investigation. But from your point of view, uh, how do you see um, the future of uh, something like CRISPR in the world of genetics and for patients and for disease? D. <laughs> well, I think the documentary um, gave a wonderful example of the young man with sickle cell disease. Um, that's a disease that, as they said, we have tried many, many therapies with really um, not great results. And, and those folks have significant chron chronic metal, medical problems throughout their lives. Um, the potential to change that um, is just astonishing to me that um, you could see this young man had the somewhat common um, outcomes or sequelae of sickle, of sickle cell disease where he'd had multiple strokes and you could see the effect on him. And the concept that we could prevent that um, in an individual to me is just astonishing. Is there a flip side to this, David? Yeah, I mean, you know, here comes the ethics again. I mean, <laughs> around the intent. What is the intent of CRISPR? The intent is to, is to uh, make a difference in someone's life, mm -hmm. is to ensure that they have a meaningful life. 
but there's so much danger there. And as long as we have oversight uh, and we look over the researcher's uh, shoulder, making sure that they are making a difference in someone's life, ensuring that they have a life and not moving towards making a life or generating a series of different lives uh, I think that's that's where we need to be, and that's getting better. There is there is significant oversight of CRISPR of what's happening, uh, but there's still danger. And I think that again, as I mentioned, from the ethical perspective, as long as we think of what the ethical issues are beforehand, how can we mitigate them? Look ahead, be ahead, stay ahead of where the technology, where the science is going, then I think we'll be okay. Do we? Um and I realize this may come out a little bit of left field, but there is an interesting question here uh, from the audience again about whether um, we should limit our conversation to genetics or we should also concern ourselves with epigenetics and epigenetic phenomena. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Because, you know, um, the DNA is your destiny uh, view is, is one, and epigenetics in that sense is a very alternative and different way to think about how the genome works. Mm -hmm. So, and yet the, the, the concerns, the, the issues, the, the um, nuances are there, of course, as well. So I think it might be interesting to discuss a little bit um, how epigenetics sits in this scenario. Who, wants to put, who can contribute here? <laughs> Casey, you are, you are a, uh, an epigeneticist. I will speak to this one. Um, so, so for anyone who's not aware, um, epigenetics describes in a broad sense, all of the things around the DNA. Um, so DNA is this double helix, which is a molecule, um, but it doesn't exist in a vacuum, actually it exists with proteins and RNAs in a cell. And so this DNA is packaged and wrapped um, very compactly, actually. There's six, six feet of DNA in one of our cells, which is tiny in our nuclei. And so um, the way that DNA is packaged and the way that the DNA interacts with the environment in the cell um, is very interesting. It, it helps determine the function of the DNA in terms of which genes turn on and become expressed or turn off and are not expressed. Um, epigenetics is why all the cells in your body have the same DNA sequence, but your neurons are very different than the beating cells in your heart. Um, and so epigenetics is just a very um, interesting field. It's expanding very much, um, but it's intimately tied to DNA sequence because DNA is a chemical molecule and um, it exists in a biochemical space. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, Donata, um, but uh, it, it, basically it my take home is cool. Yeah, so um, it does. It's all, it's all related. It does, but I, I, would, I would add that is an interesting um, component to, to what you just said. Epigenetics um, is about regulation of gene expression. Huh? Mm -hmm. I think everybody would agree in, in this panel. Um, and regulation that does not imply, and here we come to the, to the critical point, changing the sequence of the DNA, which is the concern whenever we talk about approaches like CRISPR or, or other, other, any other approach that somehow either tries to insert something in the genome or cut something out or modify it permanently or otherwise. So I think it's interesting to think about um, the possibility of epigenetic approaches that might be developed in the future that might achieve um, upregulation or downregulation, so more or less expression, for instance, of a gene of interest in ways that do not permanently change that, that gene. Because I think that that might be a switch on, switch off type of process that might run into fewer ethical hurdles and, and, and even practical set hurdles. Now, none of this is, is simple as we know only too well from the work that we do every day in our labs. But um, in terms 
of, again, aspirationally, I think that the ability to um, modulate the function of genes, not changing them permanently, but getting them to do what you want them to do um, in, in a more indirect, subtle way might be an, a very attractive, um, a very attractive role, I think. So I think that there is this sort of more nuanced approach that is not as scary as taking a piece of DNA and taking it out, because that is something that we would all be probably very, very reluctant to, to do. Um, Is there a concern, and again, I'm being, I'm looking at the questions from the audience, and uh, rightly so, several of our listeners are concerned that all of what we are discussing is extremely high-tech stuff, uh, and would be high-tech stuff for a while, um, and therefore costly. Mm. And so how widely available will it be? And how um, much uh, will, are we going to worry about disparities in access to these approaches? And, and what are your thoughts about that? David, D, primarily, but Casey well, as well. In this age of diversity and equity, I mean, it's a very clear uh, picture of where we're at. Um, we, we do know that, you know, in medicine, let's just talk about medicine, and, and there is a significant uh, disconnect you know, with uh, those who have and those who have not, uh, those of color and those who are, who are, who are uh, not a, a particular color, Native Americans like here in Arizona. And so, no, it is an issue of diversity and equity uh, and the issue of who's entitled. So if you look at the ethics, everybody's entitled. And so if we look at it that way, can we all move in that direction and say, if everybody's entitled, let's go ahead and make sure that we look at everyone the same way. Unfortunately, we're, we're not there. We're not there. We're not there yet. Uh, we haven't been there for a while. Uh, we're headed in that direction. So it is an issue. I mean, you just look at medicine. You have concierge medicine. We have physicians who uh, generate a lot of money because they have a very small number of patients who pay a lot of money just to see them uh, versus um, a, a county clinic that will see uh, others who are uh, you know, lower, low income. So it is, a, it is an issue. Um, I don't know where we're gonna go with it. Uh, it has to do with what our moral foundation is uh, and that centers around uh, a person is a person no matter what. And if you just look at it that way, then perhaps we may be on the right track. So much of the difficulty, I think, um, you're absolutely right, David. This is a this is a moral systemic question, I think, um, for all of us. But um, you know, I know frequently when I see clients, they'll ask about will my health insurance cover this, and increasingly they do. Interestingly. Um, and so, so while well, Casey mentioned the cost of, so for instance, clinical testing has come down dramatically, but, but also more health insurance uh, policies are covering some genetic testing. Um, but, but there are huge disparities and probably the biggest is folks that don't have health insurance. Um, and so they're completely left out of this this um, this opportunity, because in truth they cannot afford um, even several hundred dollars um, is likely to be too much, and so um, that is a a big issue, as well as um, insurance companies are more likely to cover um, some areas than others. We've seen dramatic increases with insurance companies covering cancer genetic testing. And what to a large degree, what that has come to is doing genetic testing that predicts treatment, which is tru truly revolutionary to me that, that you, know, you can do gene cancer genetic testing and say, this is the therapeutic option. This is the drug that will work best in this person. And that's probably the best example of sort of person, what we describe as personalized medicine. Um, but there are many people that are left out of that 
um, that system. Um, and that's frustrating. How, how, do we, how do we go about solving this problem? Because it, this is a major problem. And, and one, by the way, that is in a sense um, made worse by the fact that probably some of the people who are uh, more uh, reluctant to uh, access genetic testing, even if they had it, uh, are sometimes part of populations who would benefit the most from that genetic testing because they have pervasive genetic problems. So there is this, this paradox out there, uh, which by the way, we see also in, in not, not just in, in genetics, we see in medicine these days, we see it with COVID, that the populations who uh, would, would have to be most taken care of in terms of, of, of COVID treatment and vaccinations and everything else are also sometimes the ones who are more resistant to taking these measures. What do you think, um, can society do to obviate this problem? Is the, is, what's the way to, to solve this problem? It's a big problem. Well, you know, I think COVID has taught us a lot, unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, good and bad. Um, it's a good example of um, how science move slowly forward. Um, we certainly have learned a lot over time. I, you know, one of the um, people in public health have thought about this really carefully and there are answers to this. So uh, one, of the, one of the techniques is to use communities um, to advocate for testing. So for instance, genetic testing, or in this case, in this case COVID testing. And um, communities, I think, are much more um, important in the lives of, of individuals than we realize. And there are all kinds of communities that one could use. One could use religious communities, one could use um, community health centers, um, uh, the local gym. Uh, you know, it, there are many, many forms of that that we could use to our advantage. But I, I do, um, I do worry that there is still not a financial um, setup for individuals who choose to have testing done but don't have the finances to do it. David, I'm sure you have something to add to this. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I really like the, the analogy of communities. I, I'd like to go maybe perhaps one step further and, and call them crusaders. Uh, you know, as a pediatric critical care physician, you know, with, with pediatrics, we have crusaders, neurologists, et cetera, geneticists who are bold and courageous enough to fight the insurance company saying, I need genetic testing on this baby who just isn't right. Mm -hmm. And the insurance company says, well, it's too expensive. No, no, no. Uh, and they battle it. And so what we need, I agree with D, you need communities, you need crusaders, you need uh, who are bold and courageous enough to fight, fight for those to whom we are uh, responsible for, that we're fiduciaries, we're advocates for. Um, and, and as long as we continue to do that, uh, we'll see, we'll see over time that that will begin to be, uh, that will begin to work. Uh, you know, we're seeing it, um, you know, with children, uh, insurance companies are, are being a little bit more open to paying for genetic testing uh, for, for um, you know, genetic uh, issues with children. So uh, I agree, it's community and it's crusaders uh, who are willing to be bold and courageous enough and stand up and say, hey, you know, uh, I'll use a term, you know, bring it, you know, uh, let, let's just deal with it. And let's kind of, let's just kind of go after it. So, uh, and, and I see that happening. So this is testing, coming at testing, genetic testing from the side of the professionals who suspect that something might be wrong. But there is in the audience, uh, there are a number of questions coming in uh, asking you, the experts, to outline pros and cons of the uh, type of testing that one can do at home mm -hmm. and what, how, how to do, not how to do that, because that, that's simple, but how to interpret that and what to do with it, most importantly. What, what are your thoughts about that? Because this is a pervasive problem. 
well, <laughs> because <clears throat> we see this happen frequently. So, you know, the direct to consumer ancestry testing is really fun, <laughs> you know, and people get a kick out of it and they most of the time discover relatives, sometimes relatives they were not prepared to discover, <laughs> um, which is not, um, can be problematic. Um, my real concern about the direct to consumer testing are the health uh, issues that they're now addressing. And, and again, I'm gonna use cancer as an example because it's such a great one. So um, one of the companies does do genetic testing for three of the uh, changes within two genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2, which are, are common causes of uh, cancer in, fam in those families in which it recurs frequently. The difficulty is it really only addresses several mutate or changes in the gene, and there are thousands. And so my biggest concern is that consumers come away with, wow, my test was negative, that means I'm not gonna get breast cancer, and that is not true. There are still many other genes um, that can cause what we call genetic breast cancer. So breast cancer, for instance, that runs in families where you see you know, women in their 30s and 40s getting breast cancer and in every generation. Um, and it, it does not answer that question. So there may be folks in those families who come away saying, well, I don't need to worry about that anymore and stop having their annual mammograms and stop, you know, and that's the most worrisome part of it, I think. The other piece of it is that people often don't understand what these tests are about. And I'm a huge advocate, obviously, <laughs> of genetic counseling because what genetic counselors are trained to do is to explain what the tests can do, what they can't do, what are the pros and cons, what will be the cost, how will it work? And then ultimately, is this information that you want? Is this something that will fit into your health construct? Um, and so I would strongly <laughs> recommend that people seek genetic counseling before they have these tests done, because they may say, no, thank you. I'm not interested. This is you know, not what I wanna do. And I would uh, like to add something. I think that you made some really good points, Dee. Um, and I think that the actual flip side of what you described can also happen, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is someone learns that they carry one um, flavor of something for macular degeneration mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. something like this. And then they think they might start to have kind of an inordinate amount of worry mm -hmm. that I'm going to get this disease. Mm -hmm. But um, actually, you know, with very few exceptions of um, Mendelian disorders, they're called, um, genetics is not deterministic, mm -hmm. usually. You know, these, these mm -hmm. variants that we, we carry depend, you know, whether or not they're going to manifest into heart disease or cancer or what, you know, the common diseases like diabetes really depend upon the rest of the genome, what you inherited at many different positions, as well as what your environment and your lifestyle is. And so um, one thing I think that can be a misconception is that scientists think that genetics is determinism, mm -hmm. when in fact, it isn't necessarily um, you know, some researchers do it because they just want to know how things work. Others really are driven to help people and both of those are okay. Mm -hmm. And as Dee said, I think it's really important for people to decide for themselves whether they want to know, despite that there might be nothing they can do about the results mm -hmm. in terms of if you're at higher risk of heart disease, then you should probably, you know, eat a healthy diet and exercise, which is what you should do for every disease, no matter what. And so um, I think that it's fun and it's interesting, but only if the person wants to do it. Um, I don't think that there should be forced genetic testing, of course. I don't think anyone's saying that, but. Do you think, and, and this is for the panel, but perhaps especially for David, are physicians themselves, doctors themselves, ready to handle all this? Or, or should uh, doctors be educated differently now that uh, the more genetics becomes pervasive, should doctors themselves be trained better to handle all this? 
The answer is absolutely. So for example, right now in our medical school, we have a doctoring where we teach our medical students how to do physical exams. We have a whole session on delivering bad news. We teach them how to deliver bad news to a patient because unless they're taught how to do that and they practice it, once they get out in, in, in medicine, they're not gonna do it well. And in addition, we're teaching them now, uh, especially for example, with, um, with genetics. Do physicians do even a good, I don't even want to call it a good job. Is a physician able to do justice to informing a set of new parents that they are gonna have a baby with Downs? They're not trained how to do that. Uh, they don't know how to do that. Uh, obviously, geneticists can do that, but you get a you know you get a family medicine physician, etc. Not to downplay them, but we're, but we're not taught that. So absolutely, it's an education process, and we are moving quickly towards that, um, making it part of curriculum. We're not the only medical school that's doing that. All the medical schools across the country are dealing with the same issues, and that is beginning to teach our students how to have an honest conversation with families, uh, with patients, uh, regarding uh, the, difficult, the difficult topics that need to be had, rather than just walking in and saying, you know, I'm sorry, but you're gonna have a baby with Downs. What do you wanna do? Not a good way to go about doing it. So uh, one, one, speaking about which, um, one question that I, I am seeing in, in my, on my screen coming up uh, now more than once is whether we could give our listeners an idea of what can actually be done right now for some of these genetic diseases. We have been talking about knowing that carry a certain mutations. We are talking about, and, and what um, uh, Casey was alluding to is of course, trying the lifestyle changes that might temper your risk if you have if you carry a risk variant. But um, ca can we give our audience a sense for what can actually be done and which, which treatment, in general, of course, which type of treatments are actually available? There are several people that are asking about that. Mm. Well, I, I think, if I may, if I may, I thought that the documentary uh, uh, did a very good job in showing how complex, but also important it is to be uh, creative in the solutions that you find. And I thought that that was the example of in fact of sickle cell anemia, uh, where in fact, instead of trying to target the gene itself, uh, which uh, seems to be so um, resistant, so intractable. Um, you, you go through a kind of loop that might allow you to reach a, a, an effect that is not exactly a cure, but at least um, is a way to attenuate, mitigate the problem. Are there, um, are there examples uh, like, like that? So people are asking about that. So I think where um, the most opportunity there is in the short term is for situations like sickle cell anemia, where the actual change in the DNA um, is known, or there's a lot known about that biological pathway that's affected by that. Um, as far as I know, there are, um, you know, a short list of these sorts of uh, diseases where CRISPR is being kind of utilized now or where the genetic therapy um, is being explored. Um, I think this is going to really ex not explode, that's a negative word, but, you know, expand in the future um, uh, with oversight um, and, you know, hopefully in a way that's safe for the inheritance of, of our children. Um, but I think really one of the greater promises of genetics is once as a community that we can understand the interplay between the multiple variants and how they make us unique as who we are, including our traits and our diseases, that we will more um, accurately achieve personalized medicine. 
And so I think the promise and where we're going is that our unique DNA uh, sequence will customize what treatments we get. Um, and so I think that that's actually really exciting. Um, and we're not quite there yet. Um, in my opinion, you know, I'm sure there are some success stories, but this is something where a lot of research needs to happen and where we, we're, um, you know, medicine, you know, maybe this is the incentive that, that the medical industry needs is to actually have some positive examples of personalized medicine and how that can prevent um, diseases. So it's beneficial to the community in that way. Okay, now uh, we, we were talking about the, the, the DNA making us what we are and who we are and all the uh, issues that relate to the possibility of, of, of changing our genome and all the ethical and, and practical uh, problems that that may create uh, and also perhaps some of the solutions. So, uh, a, one of our listeners um, is curious to know um, some, what it means for two individuals to be genetically identical by 99%. And I think that that is a, a complicated question to answer. Uh, but it's probably an important question. What, what does it mean to be genetically identical by 99% to someone else or to other members of the species or of, of the other living creatures on this planet? Because we hear this I all want the to time. Answer... Yeah, yeah. So, so technically what it means is that... Um... These letters that make up our DNA, these A, T, Gs, and Cs, um, if you compare their order to that other individual, 99% will be completely similar to that person. And um, something that I think is, is quite interesting, I don't know um, the exact number, if it's 99 or 98.5, but what sets us apart from each other, you and I and everyone else, are something like 0.5% of the entire genome. And so we are so much more alike as a species, even people that are totally of different races from different parts of the world than we are different. Um, even, you know, compared to mice, my, there is huge, there's way more diversity among mouse species on the planet earth than there are among humans. Um, and so really, you know, kind of, the rosy glasses view of human genetics. And when I go to the Society of Human and Genetics meeting every year, it's really um, that genetics is bringing us together as a community. And it's about celebrating kind of both the diversity, but also the unity. Um, and so I think I, I'm going a little bit into a different topic to Donata, but um, I think that both that, 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 that tiny part of the genome that makes us different is what actually makes us interesting. <laughs> um, and the rest keeps us together. So as a perfect segue to what you just said, and this is for everyone on, in this panel, perhaps the last question, we have a couple of minutes, is if there is someone who would be interested in getting into this field uh, in a broad sense, what would be your advice, each of you? Why should one or shouldn't one? And, and how should one get into this field? What do you think? Well, I think the, the field is really broad, which is so, one of the things that's so exciting. And so when you look at the four of us, we all come at this from a slightly different perspective. Um, and there are many pathways um, that one could choose within the field of genetics. And I have to say, I've been doing this a long time <laughs> and I am continually um, amazed and astonished at the amount of things I learn every day. So I think that's one of the, mo the most interesting parts of genetics is that it is always evolving. <laughs> the science is always evolving. And so it's always exciting. There's always something new to learn about. Um, and, and as a broad statement, I think that's one of the real joys about genetics. Um, and I think all of the, the, but there are many different pathways that one can approach this. So some folks are much more interested in research. 
some folks are interested in animal research or human research, um, or, you know, um, there are just many, many aspects. And so I think, I, you know, one piece of advice would be to open your mind up to all of the different ways that you can get involved in, in genetics. Um, and of course, I'm very much on the clinical end. And so um, as a genetic counselor, um, it's been a real honor for me um, throughout my life to be able to um, have a clear understanding of the science and be able to translate that to families. Um, that is what genetic counselors, sort of the primary role of what we do. Um, and um, it's, um, it's really an honor to be involved in families learning um, about these disorders, helping them, finding resources for them. Um, and I believe the website has information about our genetic counseling graduate program. And so, I you know, most, most of us started out with undergraduate science degrees of some sort um, and then moved on um, to specialize in, in certain areas. And David, what would you say to someone who's interested in, in the bioethical and aspects of this whole enterprise? Well, I, I, I mean, it, there's, two, there's two pathways. I mean, one can go the clinical way and be a ethicist, and the other way is to be a, a, a philosophy and go from the philosophy side of ethics. Um, they're, they're really, they're a little bit different, but they're really a lot the same. It just depends on how you approach the ethical issue. For myself as a physician, a clinician, um, I, it's exciting for me to deal with and to incorporate and to embrace the uh, physician-patient relationship from a clinician side at the same time of embracing the physician-patient relationship, the ethical perspective. And so one can do it many, many different ways. As Dee said, there's a lot of venues, a lot of avenues uh, to go uh, to kind of search out. Uh, you can you can find your edge um, and decide how you want to go about doing it. It's uh, it's an incredibly exciting field, as as Dee and others have said. It's um, I mean, from my perspective, uh, from the ethical perspective, um, it, it causes sometimes consternation dealing with the ethical issues. Um, but I, I find it in, uh, enjoyable really sorting out what is the key ethical issue, what is the deal, what can we do to address it, and how do we mitigate it. And on this very upbeat note, which I love, uh, I would like to thank uh, David, D, uh, D, and Casey for being with us tonight. It was a lot of fun to be with you. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank um, our listeners, of course. Uh, Arizona Public Media has a website uh, of resources and uh, information that you can visit, and it's at tv.azpn.org slash the gene. So do check it out. you find pointers to a number of uh, other websites and sources of information. Uh, thank you to the University of Arizona and Arizona Public for facilitating this event. Thank everybody again and have a wonderful night.